Uh, so hello, hello everyone again. Um, I forgot to introduce myself before. Uh, I'm uh, Monica Jain, and I'm a professor for the Center for Urban Science and Engineering uh, at the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. So I'll be giving you a macro level overview of uh, buildings and energy in India and what we mean by green buildings. So uh, I'll talk to you about what is the big picture, why are we talking about energy, why are we talking about buildings, what do we mean by green buildings and then sort of wrapping up into the larger context of uh, urban sustainability. So why are we talking about energy, there are uh, sort of threefold uh, reasons to that, one and I'm, I'm sure that all of you are aware of, uh, have heard about climate change, global warming and greenhouse gas emissions. So use of fossil fuel energy leads to emissions of greenhouses which in turn uh, are responsible for the global warming which gives rise to unpredictable weather conditions, uh, floods, droughts, uh, heat waves, uh, hurricanes, so all kinds of uh, weather that is very unpredictable and can be uh, very harmful. Diminishing resources, uh, we know that the uh, mother earth do not have an uh, infinite uh, amount of fossil fuel resources that we are using. So we need to have a deep thought regarding how to manage the energy, in increasing energy demands uh, of the future. And the third aspect is uh, really urbanization and it uh, applies uh, very much to India because we are, we are in an increasing population and a lot of people are migrating to the urban areas for job opportunities and for a better quality of life. So these are, this is kind of a big picture why we are talking about uh, energy. Um, so just a very brief overview of what we mean by global warming, the uh, solar radiation um, that reaches the earth's surface, some of it is reflected back by the by this layer of greenhouse gases and some is absorbed by the earth's surface and I'm giving this as a very sort of uh, um, simple explanation but the when the amount of greenhouse gases increase the the solar radiation that is trapped on the earth's surface increases that in turn gives rise to the um, temperature, the overall temperature of the surface and that has been responsible for melting of the ice caps at the poles and uh, increasing the sea level and that in turn is responsible for uh, the unpredictable weather events. So that in a nutshell, so and all of this is the result of uh, basically after industrialization uh, this has increased and this is a result of the increase in the fossil fuel use. So this is the uh, uh, chart that shows the greenhouse gas emissions, what, what are the different kinds of gases that when we say greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide forms the biggest chunk of this um, greenhouse gases and if you see in blue, um, almost 60% of the greenhouse uh, of the carbon dioxide carbon emissions are due to the use of fossil fuels and by fossil fuels we mean coal, petroleum, natural gas, and, uh, things like that. Here is, are the different uh, sources that produce these greenhouse gas emissions and um, so that includes agriculture, forestry, industry. But I would like you to focus on these three um, uh, sort of these three sectors where energy supply, transport and buildings form almost half of the greenhouse gas emissions uh, that are emitted through these three sectors and this is basically very directly correlated to the human beings and the increase in population and the buildings that are uh, coming up. So uh, and this is the distribution of these emissions by country and India actually comes in the top four or five uh, when you compare uh, of the entire world, but still it is uh, one fourth of what China produces. Uh, but we, uh, but 
and mostly this is because of the uh, supply of power is through uh, use of coal. But although at this point or in 2008, this was the distribution, we are rapidly urbanizing. So this is a chart that shows, um, in red, it shows the urban population increase. And this is uh, uh, 2050. So by 2050, if you consider the world, 80% of the people will be living in urban areas. Um, currently in India, it is around 30% uh, that are living in urban areas. But in the next few decades, the increase in Asia will be uh, the maximum in terms of the immigration from rural areas to urban areas. And India itself will be adding around 500 million people um, in the next uh, few, uh, next three to four decades, which is uh, equivalent to uh, hundreds of uh, tier two cities or uh, the, we are in Mumbai, so I compared it to Mumbai, 38 Mumbai cities. So th that's wh what does that mean? That means that you are adding lot of cars to the roads, which in turn means increasing the amount of uh, fuel that is being used and greenhouse gas emissions. There are there is a rapidly increasing construction sector that is booming. So you are adding buildings, you are using the building materials and air conditioning loads and other uh, other kinds of energy consumption is being added. So uh, the, the in future electricity consumption in uh, India is expected to rise to around 2,280 billion kilowatt hour um, in 2020s and uh, it will double in the next 10 years. So this is, this is a cause for concern and that's why we are talking about energy and buildings in India particularly. Uh, this chart shows you the uh, energy consumption uh, in buildings in India and you see from 70s to um, 2010 it has been uh, rising uh, continuously and there is there will be a sharp increase uh, when we go in the next few years because of the urbanizing population and uh, if you see in 70s 15 percent of the electrical consumption was attributed to the buildings in 2010 to 11, it is more than, uh, it's almost one third, which is equivalent to the industrial sec sector, which includes the uh, power generation through coal. Uh, and among this uh, 34%, 28% is attributed to commercial and 72% is attributed to residential. So this is again an important number where uh, more than three quarters of the energy or around three quarters of the energy is attributed to housing and uh, so uh, again that becomes an important number that when we are thinking about accommodating uh, uh, the increase in population uh, and increasing the number of households we have to consider what what kind of energy efficiency measures we can uh, incorporate uh, this chart I thought is an interesting chart this is mapping the quality of life of people in different countries with the energy consumption uh, per capita. So in the green you see are the uh, countries that have a very low quality of life and the quality of life is measured through health, through GDP uh, and various other uh, factors. The red is the uh, average quality of life and the blue is mostly the developed nations where the quality of life is the highest. So the blue line shows you that this is kind of the point where this much energy is needed to have a quality of life uh, that is a that is an improved quality of life. And India is somewhere uh, here where uh, 540 uh, kilogram of emissions are emitted per person. So that's the amount of energy, and we have to we will be reaching there if we want to be uh, a nation with a uh, good quality of life. So this, there is a direct correlation between the quality of life and energy consumption. So this is also something that we have to keep in mind when we think about um, uh, improvement of quality life of, uh, of the humans uh, in the country. So uh, let's come to the uh, sort of the details of where the energy is used in buildings. 
So the first uh, part is the building operations. Throughout the life of the building, you are using your lights, your fans, uh, air conditioning, uh, coolers, refrigeration. Uh, now there is an increase in electronic equipments that we use and uh, so many different things. So this is a division for residential and commercial buildings. And if you notice that uh, most of the, a big chunk of the, um, the electrical electricity consumption is uh, by lighting and cooling both in the residential buildings and commercial buildings the lighting forms almost 60 percent of the part and the rest of it is the uh, air conditioning load so these are the two lighting and cooling loads contribute to maximum to the energy consumption of buildings and hence uh, this these are the areas that need great focus in terms of how we can conserve energy and uh, think about alternatives to provide a comfortable environment in buildings. Uh, and uh, today, one third of the energy consumption is attributed to buildings, 20% uh, to transportation. So both the buildings and transportation is related to the uh, urbanizing population. And here in the picture I show the kind of buildings that are being built, uh, usually there are glass facades, if you see the shopping malls or the offices that are being built are usually uh, glass facades and designs have been copied directly from the western countries which have a much colder climate and in India mo most of the uh, places you would not, uh, the climate only in the north is colder. So you have to be climate sensitive when the buildings are being designed and there are multiple factors that affect the uh, efficiency and comfort of the buildings. So here I list a few of them, building envelope and I'll uh, talk about some of them in a little more detail. Building envelope is basically the outer, uh, outer uh, facade of the building that separates the external weather from the in, in, inside conditions. Um, building materials, what kind of materials we use, are they sustainable, locally available? Energy harvesting, uh, thinking about alternative ways uh, in which we can um, capture energy. Uh, so the solar energy, wind energy, and also using the waste that is produced uh, as an alternative source of energy. And then the uh, last uh, picture shows that you have to, uh, the climate, although uh, there are five climatic regions in India, but the microclimate which is what surrounds uh, a particular area if you have a lake or trees around you the you will feel the difference in uh, climate as opposed to when you are in a situation where is where there are buildings in traffic so the microclimate has to be considered while designing a building and how the uh, building orientation and uh, windows and other things have to be placed so uh, again, as I mentioned, building envelope would include external walls, windows, skylights, external doors, roofs, floors, foundation systems, so any, anything that is interacting with the uh, external climate. And these are the uh, elements from which you can either lose heat if you are heating your uh, inside uh, rooms or you can gain heat through uh, the solar radiation. So this has to be designed in a way that it uh, it is, um, it basically creates a comfortable climate in terms of temperature, humidity, ventilation and if that can be achieved through passive means or minimum artificial uh, building systems. Then comes the building material. So uh, we talked about the building operations which is what you are using throughout the life of the building, the building envelope and then comes the building material. So it has uh, when we talk about building materials, we have to consider uh, from the beginning, where is uh, the raw material coming from, what kind of energy is being uh, used in manufacturing of that material, extraction, processing, packaging, shipping. Then uh, the energy used while construction and installation of those materials and then what happens to those materials after the life of the building, say 50, 60 or 100 years uh, life of the building. So the, the best scenario would be if the building material can be reused to build another building which will uh, decrease the amount of energy that is being used. Uh, 
the second best would be if you are able to recycle the material and create a new material for building the building. But if it goes to waste, then there is no recovery of energy. So those are also the aspects that you have to keep in mind um, when you're thinking about what material to use. And this chart uh, shows you a general overview of some of the common construction materials that are used and what is the embodied energy. So embodied energy is the sum of all the energy that is required to produce the materials. So the, the phase one that we saw in the last diagram. So steel has uh, the highest embodied energy uh, followed by cement. If you see the, the common materials used in India are concrete and bricks, but this is giving you a kilogram carbon emissions per ton. So the amount of material that is used, concrete and bricks, actually is a lot more than steel. So there is a high uh, component of embodied energy in the materials that we are using today in the building industry. And here this shows how transportation adds to the embodied energy of these materials. So this is this was a study done in UK and uh, so that's why if UK is getting the natural stone from the nearby places then the embodied energies is less but whereas if it is getting it from China then the transportation element adds a lot more to the building material energy. So transportation of materials so we should try to uh, see if we can get locally available materials which will make our buildings more sustainable. So uh, th that was sort of a background uh, leading to how do we want to define green buildings. And this is, uh, this is the overall picture. If we can, we talked about the building operations which is uh, using different kind of equipments, lighting, etc. Uh, throughout the building life. The building materials that we choose, uh, which incorporates both the embodied energy and the local availability, and the uh, the design of the building. So, if we can optimize on all the three and make buildings that are context and climate sensitive, that is how we will define green buildings. The buildings that can conserve energy, water use, and reduce waste through the life cycle of the building. Uh, the buildings that can use passive resources uh, for building operations. And the most important, um, important one is that it can provide health and comfort while optimizing the amount of energy and water that is being used in the buildings. Some of the uh, ingredients and benefits of green buildings. So by uh, designing your envelope, you can save energy, you can reduce the amount of uh, utility bills, the electricity uh, bills that you get and the water bills. You can also produce energy by uh, installing solar, uh, photovoltaic, solar thermal uh, or, or wind turbines uh, in the buildings, save water, conserving water through uh, efficient faucets and uh, through uh, rainwater harvesting, which is capturing the rainwater and using it for uh, different purposes. You can plant uh, the areas on the roof or around the building so that the rainwater can be captured. You can produce uh, food, uh, basically you can grow vegetables and plants in your building. So all of these features combined um, define what green buildings could be. And this uh, not only provides savings and health and comfort to the individuals who are in living in the buildings, it also reduces the burden on the uh, municipal infrastructure like the electrical grid or the sewer system because you are not um, drawing more energy or producing more waste to be uh, that burdens the system. And this also brings you closer to the nature that you have greenery around you and it improves the biodiversity uh, uh, around the buildings and improves the air quality. Uh, so uh, that's how we define the green buildings and that was more in a subjective manner but there are uh, evaluation systems uh, that have been developed to evaluate how the buildings perform and what can we call a green building and there are uh, different kinds of uh, ratings that are given to these buildings uh, and the performance is evaluated during the design construction and operation of these buildings. So uh, I've listed some of these uh, systems that are in place and I would uh, if you're interested, you can read more about it, about these systems, which will give you a deeper insight into what kind of uh, 
factors are considered when evaluating the building. So, uh, LEED, which is Leadership in Energy and Environment Design, uh, was developed in the US and that has been adopted in India by the IGBC, uh, Indian Green Building Council. Other things like BREAM, Green Globes, CASB. Uh, so, there are lots of these systems where each country adopts, adapts it to their own context. Uh, GRIHA is a system that uh, assesses the habitat and then there are other systems which actually are much more rigorous and intensive, living building challenge and life cycle analysis. So, if you are interested, you can look these up and uh, um, understand more about it and uh, as I mentioned uh, in the introduction, if you want to learn more about any of these aspects, please uh, give feedback uh, to us uh, uh, through the Moodle. Uh, so, just going back to just wrapping up and sort of giving a bigger picture. So, uh, although, so there are these rating systems which will give a rating of say silver, gold or platinum. But if you just consider the building, so here is an example of a building that has all the green features that we talked about. It has solar PV, it has a good envelope, uh, energy conservation, everything. But if everyone drives to this building, if everyone uses the cars, then they are adding a lot to the carbon emissions. And if you look in a larger context, this is not really a green building. So we have to think about a larger context and that that means the urban sustainability. So it is, and I define it as a network of buildings and services and services will, would include roads, water services, energy transmission, uh, access to education and health that can be arranged in a way that can improve the quality of life of people. And I want to I end with this that what do people really need if you think about it in their daily lives. They want access to all the daily needs like grocery, workplace, going to school, amenities like open spaces, parks, recreation, um, and necessary services like water, food, electricity. And they, they want these access with uh, improved health, safety, and aesthetics, and uh, which leads to good quality of life. So um, that's all I wanted to say. So you focus on the building part of it, how can you conserve energy and then think about the larger context where your building sits. Thank you.